So I was in Texas for a while. Me and my girlfriend just drove back to Boston and I filmed the whole road trip on this C70, trying to make that muscle memory and you know, have everything be second nature and hopefully learn all the quirks with the camera. That would be really nice to know before using it on more paid jobs. So if you already own a C70, this might help you learn how to use it quicker. And if you're thinking about buying one, maybe these little things will help nudge you in either direction. If this is the first Sounded Out Films YouTube video you've seen, hi, I'm Eric, I'm a freelance video creator. I shoot, edit, animate, composite, etc. Let's get going. Number one, the autofocus on this camera is not simple. I actually downloaded the manual and read the manual, something I haven't done for a product in I don't know how long. On my old camera, the C100 Mark II, that was just, you know, you flip the autofocus on the lens on and now the center of the frame is in focus with varying degrees of success based off the quality of the lens. But here you have like, MF boosted, face tracking, face tracking only, face tracking priority. You really need to know the definitions of all of uh, these types. I toggle on and off autofocus, so I don't have to do it on the lens, which shakes the camera. And I used the other custom button on the front of the camera to toggle on and off face tracking. I learned that this camera's face tracking only really works if the scene is well lit and the face is facing the camera, not really like the side and it's pretty prominent in frame. Still not recognizing it, still not recognizing it. There, there's a face. You hit the face, oh, and then it lost you. I think knowing the ins and outs of all the different types of autofocus is really gonna be clutch once I start using this camera on a gimbal. I haven't needed to try it, but I will soon. And I need to know when I can trust the autofocus and when to just rely on the green box and keep a consistent distance between my subject. Hey, it has two face trackers. Second thing I learned, this is not an EF camera. I kind of just thought, well, Canon makes the adapter from RF to EF. So all my EF glass should probably just basically act as if it's native glass because there's a native adapter. I used to shoot on an A7S Mark I with a comm light adapter to use all of my EF glass. And that was really a nightmare. There were a lot of glitches. It was just not fun. It's dramatically better, but there are some issues. Specifically with my camera on 24 to 70, there's this really weird glitch right here. Whenever I'm using vibration control VC, which is their version of IS with any type of autofocus, I can use vibration control or I can use autofocus. I just can't use them at the same time with this adapter or else. Luckily there's no miscommunication about like the aperture or anything like that on the Sony's. That was just maddening to not be able to see the accurate f-stop and sometimes not be able to go down because it thinks I'm already stopped down all the way. None of that happens with this RF to EF adapter, but not perfect. Number three, false color is the shit. I suggest you remap it to a custom button. Whenever I'm in a high dynamic range situation, I just on false color. Is there any red? If there is, is it on a light source that I'm okay with losing? It's a super easy foolproof way to make sure you're not blowing out anything that you don't want to blow out. And number four, sticking with exposure, the built-in LUT is perfection. My girlfriend is not a experienced videographer, but this is her using the camera with the LUT. Because I was so fascinated. Oh, I think I'm a little blown out now. Oh, just adjust with this guy. Okay. She could tell it was a half stop overexposed just by viewing the LCD screen. In my experience, a lot of other mirrorless DSLR type bodies are not like this when you're trying to expose log. I never found a utility LUT for the C100 Mark II for C-Log1 that actually worked and looked like a nice conversion to 709. You don't have to work at all to get a nice usable image right off the bat. Number five, if you do not have an M1 Mac, never ever shoot 10-bit MP4. Only shoot XFABC. Your computer's fans will start spinning like they've never spun before if you try to edit that 10-bit footage with the H.265 codec. It's a nightmare. The new Macs cut through it like butter. I don't have one of those. I made a whole video about all the recording options for the C70 where I kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. There's a card up there if you want to check that out. Number six, you can shoot pretty much in any public place with this camera. If you go without the top handle, switch out the shotgun for a lav, use a BP30 instead of a BP60, and go with a reasonably sized lens. The layman won't know if you're taking pictures or shooting luscious 4K 10-bit video footage. Number seven, remap the waveform button. When using the top handle, it's not very easy to hit the regular record button. It's gonna force you to jostle around the camera. It just kind of makes sense too because the waveform button is the only other red button on the camera. So it's really intuitive. And I also wanted to change the waveform button in the first place because I like to have it next to my right hand thumb where I can easily toggle it on and off. So I like to check it pretty frequently, but I don't like it to live there all the time. Number eight, internal NDs will change your life. 
once you experience it, I don't know how you could go back. But make sure that the extended range ND is enabled because for some reason you can only do six stops of ND when you first get the camera out of the box. So now whenever I'm outside, I can go up to eight or 10 and I never have to part with the 1.8 aperture of my beloved Sigma 18 to 35. Now that I am at ISO 800 using a bunch of ND. Dude. I, is our whole vlog just gonna be technical <laughs> jargon? So I just leave extended ND enabled all the time. I don't think there's a downside to that. If there is and someone knows, let me know. Number nine, a bit of a disappointing one. The stabilization in the C70 does not take away micro jitters in my experience, sorry to say. But it's nothing like the IS built into Canon glass that I'm used to. Here's a sample of that. And here's a sample of the C70's uh, image stabilization. Check, check. I shot some B-roll a couple days after this and I realized why the stabilization sucked. It's because it was not turned on. It was turned on in the camera, but because the lens IS was turned off, it disabled the stabilization inside the body. So I thought I was testing the camera IS, I was really testing nothing. So the only way to test the stabilization inside the camera is to use a lens that has no stabilization at all. So here is my handheld Nifty 50. And here it is with stabilization. Not half bad. You know, it's, it's not nothing. Number 10, do not buy this SD card. If you shoot 120 frames a second. I don't do like Daniel Schiffer videos. I tried to once. If, you, if that is something that's important to you, if, don't get this card because as soon as I tried to record 120 frames a second, it started buffering. Another quick update, I tested this again inside my apartment to time how long it would take for the 120 to buffer and it never did. It just kept recording and recording until my battery ran out. Go figure. I bought it because it was like half the price of the Sony card. But if you're looking to buy like three SD cards and want to save $300 and you're mostly shooting 24 or 60 occasionally, then it'll, it'll save you some money. Maybe I'll do another 10 lessons after I use this on more professional jobs and not just, you know, road trip vlog stuff. What the f um, Subscribe for more filmmaking stuff. Bye.